Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm John Berry. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of St. Vincent de Paul, Georgia. And welcome to our session tonight on poverty in America. I don't know how many of you are aware that January is Poverty Awareness Month. So this is a good program to um, discuss the topic of poverty. It's good timing for this session. We're going to go through a lot of numbers and a lot of um, a lot of statistics, but I hope that what they'll do is generate some discussion and question and, and how we can look at, at some of these issues. So we're going to start out talking about the question of what is poverty. Um, poverty can be defined in any number of different ways. Um, poverty of the spirit, poverty of, um, of friendship, poverty of education. Poverty is a lack, a need, a, a, an inability to achieve a, a desired outcome. But we're going to talk about poverty in a sense of the economic impact of poverty. And then we're going to focus a little bit on food insecurity, which I think is a critically important issue and one that um, we in the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, I know a lot of the folks here from Transfiguration that are involved in the St. Vincent de Paul ministry or in uh, other ministries are trying to address through their work. So when you look at poverty itself, um, poverty is, is defined, we look at it from a measurement perspective, oops, sorry about that, um, by a poverty threshold, which is sense, set up by the Census Bureau. And in a moment, we're going to look at the actual numbers. They're going to be hard to see on here. But um, the poverty thresholds are not more designed to be a statistical yardstick, but rather they are a description of what do people actually need to live. So if you, if you talk about or hear about poverty measures, you hear about people below the poverty line or above the poverty line, those poverty lines were established in the 60s, and it was based on what would be the cost of filling up a basket of groceries for a family. It didn't factor in challenges with health care, challenges with rental, uh, with rents, challenges with um, child care, which are all things now that are impacting families. So what the Census Bureau is trying to do is factor some of those in and really look at it. What does it take for people to subsist? What does it take for people to live? Um, under those thresholds, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, we're going to talk about the statistics. But first, before we give, even get into that, there is then a, a depth of poverty even deeper than the threshold. And that's where we really get into uh, incredibly challenging poverty. And 6.7% of the population, so 21.3 million Americans, are living in what's defined as deep poverty which means that poverty threshold that's been established, they're actually 50% uh, or more under that threshold, which is really, um, is really a difficult situation for them. And then we also have um, people who are close to poverty, people who are one paycheck away from poverty. And those are the people that we often see with St. Vincent de Paul as we're working with folks who have been stable, probably working multiple jobs, they're able to live paycheck to paycheck, but something happens that causes them to lose their stability, lose their self-sufficiency, at which point they come to organizations like us for support. And right now, almost 30% of the population is living on that margin. Um, just to give you a, a perspective on that, uh, from a, a current event that everybody's probably familiar with, we are um, in the midst of a federal government shutdown, and there are, in Georgia, 16,600 federal employees that have been, there are 16,600 federal employees in Georgia. Uh, some uh, pretty significant percentage of them, because of the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport, um, have been furloughed. And we in the society, along with the Atlanta Community Food Bank and others, are trying to address the challenges. And the number of people that have come to us who are one paycheck away from um, eviction, one paycheck away from not being able to buy their medicines, pay for their food, um, is staggering. We uh, partnered with Georgia Power to um, provide assistance, and we set up an email address for um, access, for clients to access 
our support. Um, we set that email address up on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. By Monday morning, we had 256 people that had um, access to the email address to ask us for help. And as of this afternoon, I was uh, communicating with the CEO um, of the Georgia Power Foundation. There are 658 people that have contacted us through that uh, email address. So those are all people that have, are in a situation where they don't have savings, they don't have the ability to carry through um, a situation where they're not receiving any pay for their, to pay for their rent or food. So it's a challenging situation and, and more people, you know, some of us in this room, some of us watching on Facebook, may be in that situation. I know when I was in college, when I was in early in my career, I was in that situation quite often. So these thresholds, it's really hard to see and I apologize for the, for the ugliness of the graph, but to just give you, um, I'll read it out to you, the poverty threshold for a family of um, three with two kids, which is a very typical, um, a very typical single mother household, which a lot of women you're going to see, especially women in single households, end up in these situations. Um, that poverty threshold is nineteen thousand dollars. So when you think about nineteen thousand dollars, spread that out over or divide that out of twelve months, and then divide that into four weeks, um, that's a pretty low amount of money, and yet. We still see 29.8% of the population barely there, and 6.5% of the population under that. Um, so it goes up from there. So the supplemental poverty measure, what this does is the federal government uh, Census Bureau looked at what non can or how would people be able to survive if there weren't federal benefits associated. So this factors in, if you look at all the people and they're accessing things like SNAP, things like uh, earned income tax credits, if you add that in to their income and then look at the poverty line there, where are they? And there's still 13.4% of our population that falls under the poverty measures with supplemental income associated with it. So in the United States now, we have um, a population of 321 million. This is not, uh, 2017. 43 million of those people live in poverty, which means they're living under that, um, under that supplemental measure, which is where the 13.4% we talked about came from. So who are these folks? Well, 16.3% of the people who live in poverty are women. Oftentimes, women that have children, raising them as single mothers, very often not receiving child support or any kind of support from the father of their children. 13.8% um, are men. The question then is, you know, what are driving these numbers? We just talked pretty much about why women tend to be, uh, are, are a higher percentage of population, um, but the men that are in poverty, a lot of them have to do with, um, I don't know what that um, have to do with unemployment and other factors that we'll talk about in a little bit. This statistic is a little bit sobering because these are the most vulnerable of our population. So I, I mentioned that you know earlier in my life when I was younger and I was in college, there have been times that I was right on the edge of poverty, and certainly times when I was in it. But I was young and I was you know I could handle it, I could bounce back, I had family. These are people who um, are our most vulnerable part of the population, which is our children and our seniors. Um, that's where the numbers get, as I mentioned, sober. 15.3 million children live in poverty. That's one out of every five. So if you guys over there looked at each other, um, one and a half of you, one and a quarter of you would be a hungry child if you were children sitting around statistically. And then um, the senior rate is, um, is, is also pretty sobering at 9.3%. Um, one of the big challenges if you factor in the cost of health care to seniors 
that takes that poverty rate to 14.5%. So when you think about these two populations, the people that we always talk about, we always want to care for our parents and our grandparents, we always want to care for our children, and yet they're the ones that are, are most affected by this. Ethnicity, I don't think this is a surprise um, to anyone. If you look at the populations that are in poverty, um, the predominant population by demographic that uh, lives in poverty are people we have not um, generally talked about, and that's Native Americans. So if you go to areas with a high Native American population in the Southwest, specifically up in the upper Midwest, um, you see a lot more of it than we do here in Georgia. The African American population, very high percentage, especially among young uh, teenage black Americans, Hispanics, and then you look at whites and Asians, um, they're still not good numbers, but about half of what you see in the other populations. And then this is one that I find really important to talk about because what we often say in response to, or what we often hear said in response to people in poverty is, well, if they would just get a job, they wouldn't be in poverty anymore. Or why don't they just get off their butts and get a job? Well, 7% of the population of the United States that are employed live in poverty. And when you think about um, the, the, the wage, um, the wages that are paid for, for unskilled, uneducated jobs, the federal minimum wage is seven dollars and fifty some odd cents an hour, um, and with a population that, in the past couple of years, was going after a small number of jobs. This is a pretty sobering statistic. Um, the economy has gotten better, and unemployment has been driven down somewhat. So we're starting to see where uh, big employers that were getting away with paying, you know minimum wage or just barely above it, are now having to start paying more, having to start to pay more money because the labor pool is decreasing. So that's a good thing um, because the, the market is driving, is driving rates up. But this population among, among poverty among the employed is a really, um, is a really bad number when you think about it from a social perspective because we value work, work is what we, um, what we um, strive for, it's part of our Catholic social teaching. It's one of the tenets of our Catholic social teaching, which is the dignity of work. And when we have people in jobs who still need to access services from either the federal government or organizations like St. Vincent de Paul, because their wages are not enough for them to, um, to live, there's something wrong with that. And there's something that, that has to be done about that. <coughs> this is another population that um, the, the statistics we don't often talk about, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to put it up there. Um, adults with disabilities. One of the challenges, and in Georgia here, Governor Deal was, was really out front on addressing issues around um, how do we deal with folks that are coming out of certain constituencies to help make sure that they are set um, in their lives. And one that he identified, he had five pillars, which were um, people coming out of drug rehabilitation, people coming out of prison, people coming out of long-term homelessness, um, and then, I forgot the fourth one, and then the fifth one was children aging out of foster care. Well, a lot of the children that are in foster care um, are disabled which is a statistic a lot of people don't even realize, but that population is one that we're challenged in finding out. What happens when somebody ages out of foster care? Um, we have a young guy that does, well he's not that young anymore, he's almost 30, a guy that does our maintenance at our facility in Shambly, and we brought him in through the Bobby Dodd Institute. He's um, got the, the mental capacity of about a seven or eight year old. He's the nicest guy on the face of the earth. He does a great job but he has two parents and an older sister. When his parents pass, he has nowhere else to go. 
and his older sister, because of her love for him, will probably take him in and take care of him. But think about the challenge that she has as you know, a young woman, early 30s, trying to establish a family and children and, and a career, um, having, having this. So how do we address that issue with, with people like him? Any questions at that point? I know it's a lot of boring numbers, and you're probably sitting there going, I didn't want to talk about a bunch of boring numbers, but when we talk about poverty, um, a lot of it's driven by numbers. Question? Anybody have a question? Um, all right, so one of the things that comes out of poverty and one of the real um, challenges we face universally, but, but we're going to talk about it here in Georgia, is around food insecurity. So that's one of the, the aspects of dealing with issues with poverty. There's the financial aspect, you know, direct assistance. So from the standpoint of the Society of St. Vincent Paul, we provided about $17 million worth of support to people in poverty in the state of Georgia last year. 129,000 people that we served. And a large portion of those people we served through in-kind support around food. Um, we have a program I'll talk about a little bit in our food recovery and distribution program that is part of that. But we, run, we operate 38 food pantries. And those 38 food pantries we operate in the state are constantly accessed by people. Um, and it has to do with food insecurity. And what we're going to talk about is that food insecurity is not hunger. So we talk about hunger a lot. St. Vincent Paul talks about hunger. The food bank talks about hunger. It's always this, we need to, we need to stop hunger. We need to fight hunger. Well, hunger is not the issue. Food insecurity is the issue. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. So, we talked about poverty and how many children live in poverty. Anybody remember what the percentage was? How many children live? How many children live in poverty? 21, 22 percent of the children in the country live in poverty. One in six children live in a food insecure household. Um, that's not a good statistic. What that means is one in six children don't know whether they're, where they're going to get their meals um, each day. I, this is a, um, something that I ask all the groups I talk to. Imagine yourself, and you know, we have a teacher in the room, we have a former teacher in the room, we have a professor in the room. So think back to, or think now, school days and snow days. And think about your own kids when you raised your kids, right? What was the most exciting day for most of our kids? It was a snow day, right? Hey, I don't have to go to school. I can stay home and go sledding. You know, I hope this snow stays forever. When I grew up in New York, you know, we get a lot of it. Here, you don't get quite as much. Now think about a child whose only meal for that day is coming at school. So when that kid wakes up in the morning and looks out the window and sees snow, they're not, probably not so excited about the fact that it's a snow day. These children, these one in six, most of them get at least one, if not two, of their meals of the day, and oftentimes the only meals of the day through school lunch and school breakfast programs. Um, that's what food insecurity is all about. Their parents sacrifice their own meals so that their children can eat. So that's what food insecurity is all about. And we'll go a little more into that. So if you look at food insecurity uh, in the United States for all households, this is from 2015. Again, this is a, a, some numbers, but they're important numbers. 12.7% um, of the population of all households are suffering from challenges around food insecurity. If you look at it as it goes through the various um, household types, households with children, 16.6%. Households with children under six or under five, six, 16.9%. But remember the poverty statistics we talked about earlier, females in poverty, look at the numbers of female head of household with no spouse in food insecure households. 30% of the females in the United States 
who are food insecure or um, are in a food insecure household if they are a single mother with children. We don't talk often about male heads of household, but there are a lot of male heads of household out there. Some of them as a result of, of death, a lot as a result of divorce, especially over the last seven, eight, nine years where judges have started to award custody more equitably between husbands and wives. In the past, you know, it was, it was no matter what the situation was, the woman generally got custody. That's changed over the years. So we see this bump in male head of households. The challenge for them is, be, is that there is an inbred prejudice within the social service sector. Now, I've been in, this, in the nonprofit human services sector for 12 years. And I know, because I've seen it over the years, there is just a, an inbred prejudice against single men. And you see it in some of the laws that have recently been passed. This is not a political statement. It's just a statement of um, when they passed the laws in Georgia and federal laws that said, if you're an able-bodied male, you have to work or you can't get SNAP. Females are exempted. So if you were an able-bodied female, it didn't matter. Because the assumption was, well, you're taking care of kids. It's the guys that are not. Um, so that, that's just part of our social makeup. And um, that number generally isn't seen that often. If you look at the, the numbers regarding race, they're very similar to the poverty numbers, right? Whites are, are at the lower end, and blacks are at the top, and Hispanics are just underneath the, uh, just underneath the, um, the black population. Hungry seniors, we talked about hungry seniors. Um, we talked about their poverty level. Food insecurity among seniors is, is, a, is a critical issue, and it's a, an issue that has gotten a lot of comment over the years. Um, generally, when we talk about seniors who have had to eat cat food or whatever in order to, to make the day, you hear stories about that and that kind of thing. But the reality is it's, a, it's much more than that in that one in seven, 5.7 million seniors are food insecure. So when you think about what are some of the drivers behind that issue for seniors, um, some of it is an inability to access food. So I have a 92 year old mother, thank God she's got her family, but she's not gonna get in a car and drive from her apartment to Publix to shop. And when she was in her own home in South Carolina by herself, you know, she, I don't know what she was doing, but it wasn't good, which is why we got her moved down here into an assisted living facility. Well, there's a lot of seniors don't have family that are around them. They don't have family that care about them. They may not have family at all. They may have just grown up. Um, their kids may, may be whatever. But getting to the food is a challenge for them. Then you've got the fact that they're living on, in poverty, as we talked about earlier. A lot of people are living on Social Security only. And if they don't have uh, someone, if they don't have other access to other funds, food becomes a very challenging um, hurdle for them. Then tied to that, and one of the things that impacts the inability to have food security is health. So many seniors, even with Medicaid, Medicare, um, are put in a situation of having to decide between their medications and food, or their medications and their um, utilities, or their mortgages. So I tell a personal uh, example just to give you a perspective on that. You know, I'm, I have a job, I have a very good health plan through our Society of St. Vincent de Paul. I have a medical condition that I take three drugs a day for. Uh, atrial fibrillation. So it's it's uh, you know an irritant, dangerous, but it's an irritant. And I take three medications with a great insurance plan. I pay about fifty dollars a month in my copays for those three medications. So think for a moment about somebody who's a senior or somebody in poverty who's having to make that choice without insurance. Um, if they were able to find those medications, and if they were able to be $50 a month, that's a week's worth of food. 
that's a weakness for the food for them or their children. So seniors and hunger are a big issue. If you look at the prevalence of food insecurity in the United States, um, it's nice to see Georgia's not at the bottom. We're, we're in the middle band of states. Um, if you look at some, some of the states down uh, in, the, in the true south, uh, mid-south, uh, that's where some of the highest levels of food insecurity are. If you look up in the Midwest, if you look at Indiana, Ohio, and West Virginia, Part of the reason you see that up there is the high rates of unemployment because of the industrial um, sector that over the years has, has declined. One of the reasons that you see the food insecurity close to the average for Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina is the influx of um, people into the state from um, other areas for mostly around Atlanta. Because if you took Atlanta out of the picture and just looked at rural Georgia, it would be deep red. And again, it's because of the high rate rates of unemployment, the lack of industry, the lack of economic opportunity. In Georgia, one in five people are food insecure. So when we said at or near, it was one in six for the United States population as a whole. It's one in five for people in Georgia. So I talked about it now for 10 minutes or so of food insecurity. Yes, Deb? There's a question on Facebook. Um, not necessarily a question, but a statement that maybe you can answer this. Yeah. In regards to disabilities and yeah. applying for SSI, it is a difficult thing. The, the question was, it's difficult to get SSI. Right. Why does it take so long? Do you have any idea? Um, I know you have to almost apply twice for it. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, I'm not. I'm not familiar with the process in the sense I'm not an SSI lawyer. I know we deal with a lot of people who are having challenges um, accessing that, um, and I, I don't. I wouldn't speculate on what the answer is, but I would strongly suggest anybody who needs to. There are pro bono law firms out there and pro bono. Um, Nonprofit organizations that will work with people that are trying to access Social Security disability benefits. So, when people get SSI, do they automatically um, qualify for Medicaid? Do they get some kind of medical insurance when no. you have SSI? No. Medicaid is set on your income, SSI is set on your physical, so a disability or something keeping you from working. And Medicare is based on age. Okay. And those are three independent. And there's a lot of, it's a good question because from a social policy, policy perspective, there is a lot of um, discussion around the fact that there is a lack of integration among the blanket of services. So what you end up seeing is, is a, let's say you have a person who is, um, is aged, is disabled, has a low income, they really have to access three completely separate channels to get the benefits that are available to them. So what we've done in this country and in, in states is created this patchwork of, um, of the safety net. And, and, and what's happening is people are um, being caught by this part of the safety net, but then falling through the hole in the next part because they can't get SSI or something like that. What needs to happen, in my opinion, is there needs to be a coordinated effort of care. And, and we're doing that in the homeless sector with continuum of care and other approaches to homelessness. But we're looking at the totality of the person's situation. So, you know, why are you homeless? What do we have to do? Let's get you off the street and in a home first because then we can try and fix the issues around it. We haven't done that with the economic side of it. So we haven't looked at what's involved in your lack of ability to, to meet the, your, your daily living needs. That's what, what St. Vincent de Paul does when we talk about our mission being to help people achieve stability and then uh, to, 
good st stability and then achieve, get on the road to achieving self-sufficiency. Our goal is to not only stop the bleeding, but then figure out how can we prevent the wound. Um, and there is a lot involved in that. So we partner, and I'm gonna touch on St. Vincent de Paul near the end of this presentation. We partner with, with literally hundreds of agencies, and what we try to do is be a hub, a hub in the hub and spoke. So when we deal with, with you, Bev, and you've got a challenge around being able to meet your electric bill or pay your mortgage, we come in and, and try to work with you to figure out, so who else can we get with so that we can pay it for you this month and maybe next month, but who's paying it for it the month after that? So SSI is one of those things. But, you know, the simple, the, the simple smart aleck answer would be what's the federal government we expect, but there's a whole lot more to it than that. So what is food insecurity? We talked about food insecurity, and I mentioned earlier, food insecurity is, is much different than hunger, and it's much more, um, it's much more uh, challenging. So the classic definition of food insecurity is it's the state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food. More than 800 million people live every day with hunger or food insecurity, as their constant companion. Food insecurity is not hunger. And this is an important point. Food insecurity is the condition assessed in the food security survey and represented in USDA food security report. It's a household level economic and social condition of limited or uncertain access to adequate food. Hunger is an individual level physiological condition that may result from food, may result from food insecurity. But when we talk about hunger, we run the risk of minimizing the depth of the issues around food insecurity. So I was telling, again, going to a personal example, I was telling Bev earlier, um, my wife and I are both trying to shed some of our, some of our holiday pounds from you know, the holiday that started in 4th of July. Or, and as a result, there are quite a few times during the day that I'm hungry, right? Well, I am able to eliminate that hunger easily. I can go to McDonald's and grab a hamburger. I can make a big steak for dinner at night. I can go buy a Mars bar. I'm not food insecure. I've made a conscious decision to be hungry. We're hungry when we fast. On, on Good Friday. We've made a conscious decision to do that, but we're not food insecure. So in the back of our minds, we don't have this fear, when I go home tonight, what am I going to eat? What am I going to feed my children? How are my children going to eat? If it snows and my children can't go to school, how are they going to eat? So that's where food insecurity, and that's where the challenges around food insecurity really become critically important. Food pantries and food banks are a vital and important part of stopping hunger on a, um, on a one time, one week, one month basis. When somebody comes to one of our food pantries, the great food pantry that's right here at Transfiguration, and they give them a couple of bags of food, we've stopped the hunger, but we haven't eliminated the food insecurity. Because if Transfiguration decided tomorrow to close the food pantry, then all of a sudden uncertainty reigns again. So the challenge is to address issues around food insecurity. We're gonna talk about those issues. Questions at this point, especially on food insecurity, really critical point. Um, and I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here with this group because you're all socially engaged and involved, but Hopefully we're talking about some new things. So when you look at food insecurity, the way the USDA, US Department of Agriculture, looks at things, high food security, household has no problem or anxiety about consistently accessing adequate food. We know where we're gonna get our food, probably know where we can get more food than we need. We know every day, Food, food is an afterthought for us. And for those with high food security, you know, how many times have you heard talk about somebody being a foodie, right? So think about it. A foodie means you just have, food is the last, it's a hobby for you. 
versus a life survival necessity. Nothing's really wrong with that. It's just, you know, that that level of food security. You don't yeah. think about it. When was the last time anybody sitting in this room thought about where they were going to get their next meal? Hopefully not, not for a long, long, long time. Marginal food security, the household had a problem or anxiety at times about accessing adequate food, but the quality, variety, and quantity of the food was not substantially reduced. So this is the typical... Um, person who, you know, the, the expression we use is they ran out of month before they, or they ran out of money before they ran out of month. So uh, maybe they don't know how to budget so well, maybe they live a little bit on the edge and comes near the end of the month, you know, paycheck, that, the last paycheck hasn't got here yet, and now we're eating, you know, grilled cheese. Um, when I was growing up, my father went through a relatively long period of um, unemployment. And I remember my mother um, making, telling us kids how exciting it was that we were gonna have grilled cheese, you know, and what a great meal grilled cheese was. And, you know, we bought into it. What kid doesn't like grilled cheese, right? Until about the third night of grilled cheese. And then it was like, uh, you know? But we never went hungry. We never missed a meal. Um, so we were, we were more in the marginal food security during that period. Low food security, households reduced the quality, variety, and desirability of their diets, but the quantity of food intake and normal eating pattern, patterns were not substantially disrupted. So this is kind of, maybe the, um, this is a, um, instead of being able to put a meal on the table that consists of a vegetable and a starch and meat, maybe the meal is, um, a, a uh, hamburger helper or, or something that it's there, but it's really not all that good for you. I talk about um, how many of you in this room subsisted for an entire semester in college on a case of cup of noodles, right? Or at least a couple of cases of cup of noodles. And anybody who really had, had a college experience, that's what you did, because you were spending the rest of that money on partying and, and that kind of stuff. Um, that kind of is what that is without making light of it, but people are eating, they're just not eating well. And maybe they're not eating quite as much as they would normally, and it's very simple blame. And then you've got very low food security. So this is, is, is the bad part, that's why it's in red, right? Um, at times during the year, eating patterns of one or more household members were disrupted and food intake reduced because the household lacked money or other resources for food. So this is how USDA looks at it. So this is the mother who makes a, a pot of beans one night and makes sure that each child has a good amount of food to get them through the night and get them going for tomorrow and, and leaves herself with nothing. Or, or, a, or a tiny couple of teaspoons worth. And, you know, when, when people are in that situation and they're dealing with their kids, they never, well, I shouldn't say never, but, but you know, what the message to their kid is, oh, don't worry, honey, I'm not hungry. Why don't you, why don't you take some more? It's that, that inherent protection mechanism that we have with our children. So we suffer because we want them to, um, we want them to be able to be nutrition. Mm -hmm. Have nutrition. So why do we have food insecurity? This is, is the richest nation on the face of the earth. We're the most innovative nation on the face of the earth. We're the most generous nation on the face of the earth. Why does food insecurity exist in a, in a country like this? So, Feeding America, which is one of the, the big blanket um, nonprofits that deals with food insecurity and food banks around the country, has put together uh, this chart. And again, for those of you that are watching on Facebook, I apologize that it's hard for you to see, but um, I believe we're gonna be able to make this PowerPoint available to all of you if you contact the parish um, and would like a copy of it. Um, so when we talk about challenges around economic decisions that are impacting the ability to have adequate food and to be food secure. 
Um, 69% of the people that Feeding America worked with as clients over the, the nation, 69% of the people that they dealt with, which means they were coming to Feeding America because they could not adequately provide food for their family, 69% had to choose between food and utilities. So almost 70%, almost 7 out of 10 people had to make a conscious decision, do I have my electricity continue to be on, or do I have, uh, we have some technical difficulties. So 70% had to make a decision between whether they were going to have heat in the winter, uh, lights on, or buy food. 67% had to choose between food and transportation. So on the surface, you could you may look at that and, and blow it off and say, well, you know, if it was up to me, from a food secure perspective, it's, it, it's easy to look at others and judge and say, well, you know, they don't need a car. They probably should feed their family before they worry about a car. Well, people have to get to a job. People have to get their kids to school. There's all challenges around transportation that those decisions are not easy decisions. If they were easy, people would have no challenge and it wouldn't be a, an issue. 66% um, had to choose between food and medical care. 57% between food and housing. And 31% between food and education. So if you add those up, they're obviously well above 100%, right? And the reason is because there are multiple issues that people deal with at different times in their lives. And what you see happening oftentimes is, okay, this month I'm gonna tell the electric, I'm gonna kind of blow off the electric company and I'm gonna push that off. Next month I'm gonna skip my medicines. The month after that, I'm gonna you know, do something else. So it's a balancing act. We have a, some of you were maybe participated in a program we did with Dr. Donna Beagle a couple of months ago here, and Donna, Dr. Beagle talks frequently about how tiring it is to be poor. And the reason it's so tiring is because you're constantly having to plot and plan and figure out how you're gonna get through the day. We come home from work, most of us, I think most of the time, I wouldn't be wrong in saying, we had a rough day, we'd come back, we'd plop on the couch, maybe we flip on the TV, maybe we pick up a book, but it's kind of like, leave me alone, I just want to decompress. When you're in poverty, you're coming home from your job, which is probably a manual, unskilled, unsatisfying, mentally, and emotionally job, and now you're facing this entire complex set of problems just to figure out how you're going to get through tomorrow. So think about that every day of your life. What you're doing is having to figure out, how will I get through tomorrow? It's exhausting, and it impacts people's health, and it impacts their ability to survive. Um, so when people are in food insecurity, and they're looking at how they're going to survive day to day, they look at, um, nutrition, nutrition assistance programs that are available through government agencies, but they also come up with other coping strategies. And that's what I was just talking about. So as they sit and they look at how are we going to get through this, they're going um, and they're purchasing inexpensive, unhealthy food. You have heard maybe people say, um, well, poor people aren't, aren't uh, can't, have, have no reason, sorry, let me start again. You hear people say, poor people aren't hungry, just look at how overweight they are. Look at how, you know, fat they are. Well, the reason is because they're eating totally unhealthy food, like cup of noodles every night. Um, McDonald's, they say, well, you, say, you hear people say, well, how can they be poor? They go to McDonald's. Well, think about it. You get a pretty filling, not nutritious, a filling meal at McDonald's for under five dollars. Two double cheeseburgers and a Coke cost you two dollars or four dollars and some odd cents. 
I know because occasionally I get a, I gotta have a McDonald's double cheeseburger and you pull in and for two bucks you get lunch, you get two of them. Um, so they've, they're getting unhealthy, inexpensive food. 53% re receive help from family and friends. Um, that's that's uh, actually a statistic that I, I assumed was higher, but that's what it is. 40% watered down food or drinks. So that's the buy a can of Hormel chili, put it in a pot, and add a full can of water to it. And you basically feed your family and your kids gruel because it goes twice as far. 35% sell or pawn personal property. So wedding rings, um, furniture, unfortunately their bodies, their selves. Many of the young, um, if you look at sex trafficking and what's going on in the sex industry, um, the big, um, the big um, focus is on young women who have left home and have gone, you know, they're going to make their way in the big world, they're going to come to New York City, be actresses, or whatever it might be. And that's a significant uh, part of that. But a bigger part of that population in the sex trade are women who have, and boys, men, who have had to go into that industry in order to survive, um, to buy food. Many of them have kids. Um, so it's a very complex issue, but 35% of people are doing things like that. And then 23% of people grow food in their own garden, which is, is a positive thing. Um, they uh, grow some food, they try and use that to supplement their, their uh, lack of food security. So we talked about McDonald's, we talked about unhealthy food, we talked about um, that aspect of it. And a term that, that you may have heard is frequently used is something called a food desert. So, you know, what is a food desert? Food desert is a place where there are no grocery stores, no farmer's markets. They're surrounded by fast food, junk food, or food high in sugars and fats. So remember I mentioned earlier, for $3, you could buy some broccoli, some orange juice, and some cherries for 312 calories. Or... You can buy some soda, some munchies, some pork rinds, some Twinkies for 3,767 calories. So look at those two things and tell me which one is more filling. If you're hungry, some cherries and a glass of orange juice and some broccoli is not really going to be exciting. And if you've got kids, right, try feeding that to your kid. Look at the difference. Ten times as many calories in that. Um, we have a... a St. Vincent Paul, we have a facility in Lakewood Heights, which is a pretty poor area of, of Atlanta, in southeast Atlanta. And um, about five years ago, six years ago, we opened a food pantry there. And my chief operating officer and I decided that we wanted to see what the people who lived in that neighborhood, because we were trying to decide what we would have in there and how we would have it. Um, and it was in a food desert. So we decided that we were going to put ourselves in the shoes of the people that would be coming for us to, for service. And we decided that we were going to think, find out what it took to go shopping in a grocery store. Technical difficulties again. So we decided what we were gonna, that we were going to try and figure out what it would take to, to buy a healthy um, basket of food. So we ended up from going from our facility on Lakewood Avenue and Lakewood Heights. The closest supermarket was a Publix on the other side of the connector in downtown Atlanta over by the state capitol. And we put ourselves in our client's shoes and we said we don't own a car. We use public transportation which in the city you can. Up here you can't. Um, so we decided to figure out what it would take. Well, it took us about an hour and 45 minutes to get from our facility to the grocery store. We had to take two buses, we had to walk, I think it was probably close to a mile to get there. And then we bought, now this, Kevin was six foot two, bigger than me, younger guy, younger than me. I'm not a bad shape and I'm not, a bad, I'm not like I'm an old, completely decrepit guy. And 
And so we got a bunch of bags of stuff. We bought a, the equivalent of a full basket of groceries, and we carried it back on the bus. First we walked, then we took two buses to get back to, Lake, to the, the Lakewood Family Support Center. We were exhausted. We were wiped out. And we said to ourselves, what if we were a single mother trying to tow along three kids to do this? It's impossible. Directly across the street from our Lakewood Family Support Center was a gas station that sold beer and everything else. Also sold drugs, that's why it was shut down, thank God. And down a couple of blocks from us was one of these corner mini marts that sold lottery tickets, cash checks, and had a grocery section. What do you think was in there? It was all this kind of stuff. And it wasn't $3 for a bunch of soda and some munchies and unhealthy Twinkies. It was about $9 because they had a captured audience. So, you know, if you're, how many of us have ever been on the road and you're at night, you're driving across the country or something, and you realize, oh no, I'm almost out of gas, and you're in the middle of somewhere uh, on the highway, and you have to pull off to get gas, and you know what those people do, right? Gas in your neighborhood at home is, let's say right now it's what, two, two bucks a gallon or something like that. You go to one of these places, four bucks a gallon, because they got you, they got you, right? That's what happens with these. So that's the challenge of food deserts. Why do we care about hunger beyond just the fact that we care about people morally we want to live out the, our gospel beliefs and our Catholic social teaching. Hunger, obviously, is not a good thing, but hunger is a reinforcing mechanism that drives poverty and drives more hunger. So when you look at food insecurity, hunger, and malnutrition, fear, what that drives is poor physical and cognitive development. So put yourself in the position of a a mother or a father going to work to earn money for their family. Put yourself back in that situation I mentioned earlier where at dinner the night before, mom realized there wasn't enough food for the two kids and her, so she sacrificed and gave each of them a full bowl of stew, and she had a teaspoon full and a cup of tea. The next day, she's got to get up and go to work. Doesn't have breakfast because there's not enough food. The kids are getting breakfast at school. What kind of a performer do you think she is at her job? Probably not good, right? You take that child, let's say there was no food. The child was not able to eat that night. The next day they're getting up and they're going to school. Ask yourself, how are they going to perform in class? How can you learn when you're sitting there worried about the hunger pangs in your stomach or the fact that you don't know when you go home tonight whether you're going to be able to eat or not. So that poor physical and cognitive development drives low productivity, which ends up causing kids to drop out of school, causing kids to fail out of school, causing people to not be promoted at their jobs, or causing people to get fired from their jobs. Because keep in mind also, a lot of these people, and this is not a, a pejorative condemnation of people that are hungry or food insecure, but the reality, the statistics, the numbers show that a large portion of these um, people that are in these situations have low skills and low education. So the jobs they're in are not easy, cushy office jobs where they can kick back and you know, close their eyes for 20 minutes if they're tired. These are, are out in the, in the elements, they're in warehouses, they're in jobs that can be very dangerous if you're not paying attention to what you're doing. If you're a warehouse uh, operating a forklift in a warehouse and you're you know, spaced out or, or thinking about being hungry, you can cause injury to yourself or others. So what that ends up doing is continuing this cycle of poverty because now it's going on and on and on and that's where we see, when we talk about generational poverty, one of the reasons generational poverty exists, one of the reasons, there's a lot of others, but one of them is the fact that this cycle continues and families who are in poverty who don't get out end up oftentimes with the next generation
generation and the next generation of poverty. So there are three things we have to address in, in order to address food insecurity. The first thing is food availability. We have to look at the production of food, the distribution of food, and the exchange. The second is food, food utilization, the nutritional value, the social value, and food safety. And then the last is food access, affordability, allocation, and preference. So these three all need to be addressed in order to address the issues of food insecurity. We're not going to go through every one of those because we'd be here until next Thursday. So we're going to just talk about um, some higher level things. One of the first things that um, is really important for us to understand is that the SNAPs, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, used to be called Food Stamps, Federal Government Assistance to Hungry Families, makes a significant difference in the lives of people who are in food insecure situations. It doesn't matter. Thank you. I'm going to just hold this. Does it help if I hold it or does it doesn't make a difference? All right. So I'm not going to hold it. It doesn't matter what. The SNAP is not a political issue. Um, Tom Price, who was the congressman that represented this area, who was a very conservative Republican, was one of the prime um, friends of ours, friends of mine, when it came to SNAP. He did stuff at our facility, he came and visited, he did press conferences on SNAP. Um, some of the Democrat, a lot of the Democratic side of the political spectrum obviously are very, um, very supportive of SNAP. So the issues around SNAP have nothing to do with the effectiveness of the program, they just have to do with the way it's, it's been implemented. SNAP, by the way, has the lowest the lowest percentage of fraud of any federal program in the United, in the, in the United States. It's the, most, um, it's the most efficient and, and the lowest level of fraud. But if you look at the numbers, the percentage of households that are food insecure that are 65% uh, drop to 54% once they start getting on SNAP for six months. Uh, households with children goes from 32.3 to 22.5, 35 to 29. So SNAP is something that um, we continue to work on. The Congress has been um, addressing it in a, in a pretty adequate way, but it's a program that we have to make sure we provide accessibility for. So that the challenge is not that SNAP exists, the challenge is how do we get people to be able to access it. And then it's being eaten around the edges by certain groups that want to minimize it. Some of the stuff they're talking about can make some sense, but, but others needs to be addressed. Here's one that everyone in this room, including myself, is guilty of. Food waste. Household food waste, it's estimated that Americans throw out 25% of the food that they buy. Think about that. 25% of the food we buy ends up being thrown away. 33% of fish and seafood. So think about how many times you bought piece of salmon or, or a piece of fish, and then something came up, you didn't eat it because you had to come watch me at a class here at Transfiguration, or you had to go somewhere else. And a couple of days later, you remember, oh yeah, that fish. And you pull it out, and you just go, eh, I don't know, I've had it for years, and throw it away. Right? It's a common occurrence. We, we all do it. Stuff in the back of the freezer where you go back, and it's, I, I just did this the other day. I pulled this thing out, I said to my wife, what is this? <laughs> she said, I don't know. We've all looked at it as something we put in the freezer months ago. Throw it away, right? That's a challenge that if we can help reduce that waste, then that food can be available for other sources. 30% of roots and tubers, 28% of vegetables, you can read the stats. But household food waste is a huge challenge and it, it has impact on food availability. This is a, another one of those slides that has a boatload of words on it. Again, um, you know, sorry about that, but um, some of the solutions to food deserts are community actions, grow food locally. This is a big, big deal in uh, Atlanta right now, in Metro Atlanta. Bill Bowling, who ran the Atlanta Community Food Bank for 33 years, um, has now taken on this passion uh, initiative of, of creating these community gardens. I know the Transfiguration Sigmund's Paul Conference had a community garden for a while. We ran one down at our own Lakewood 
our old South East Atlanta facility. But community gardens are really a great way for people to get healthy, nutritious vegetables and produce. Um, access to food, um, replace convenience with quality. So I talked about that gas station or that uh, small corner store down by our Lakewood facility. There also was a, um, well, we, we were able to put our food pantry so we had more quality food there. But there was also was a nonprofit that started in that area that um, set up a little corner grocery store that only served, only sold healthy, nutritious foods, and they sold it at close to cost. So it was a good community way to address the issues in the neighborhood. Um, more full-scale grocery stores. There's a real, I give Kroger a lot of credit. Kroger is really trying to figure out how can they with neighborhoods and open grocery stores in places where they haven't been before. Um, they're looking at different models. They're trying to figure out, you know, if the challenge is how do, you, how do they make money? That's what they're in business for, right? So what they're starting to look at is things like, well, maybe we don't need, you know, the gourmet for the, for the time to see if they can do that. So well, credit to them. Transportation. Downtown Atlanta, you can get from point A to point B on the bus or on a train. You can't in the suburbs. And that's a real challenge for us. So here, um, transportation is really critically important. How do we address those? And then things like empowerment on cooking classes and nutritional education. We are um, doing a big six and a half million dollar campaign to update our facility. And one of the things we're doing with that is we're putting a teaching kitchen in there. And the reason is we want to be able to help. We're using the University of Georgia Extension Services teaching classes on that. Um, so help people learn how can you make nutritious meals from the foods that are available to you, to you in the food pantries. I'll give you an example of something that happened, and this was probably, uh, well, 2008, so it was almost 11 years ago. Um, we opened our food pantry in Shambly we have a big client choice food pantry, so it's like a supermarket. And Kraft Foods, who's a very generous supporter of ours, sent us uh, two or three pallets of macaroni and cheese. Yeah. Um, huge macaroni and cheese, right? So it's not that nutritious, but it, it provides more nutrition than some of the alternatives. We put it out on the shelves, and we were all excited because we figured people were going to come and take it, and it just sat there. Nobody took it. We have a huge Hispanic population in that part of Chambly that accesses our food pantry. It's probably 80% Hispanic. So we finally asked somebody, why don't you take, I don't speak Spanish, but my reception is there. Why aren't you taking the food? And she said to us, no self-respecting Hispanic person is going to eat cheese out of a box. So we were like, oh, you know, cheese is an important part of the, of the Hispanic diet. And, and in the, not in the diet, but in the foods and what they cook. So we, we thought, what are we going to do with four pallets of macaroni and cheese? So we came up with a Costco idea. And we actually cooked up macaroni and cheese and we had it available. And when people tasted it, especially the kids, they were like, ooh, this isn't bad. And we were able to provide food. So cooking education, nutritional education, but to the, to the ooh comment over here, you don't want people just having a plate full of macaroni and cheese, right? So those are some of the things we can do to, to help uh, eliminate some of the food hazards. <coughs> this is a quote we operate on. Um, it's, a, it's a quote, I think, from Mother Teresa that makes a lot of sense. If you can't feed 100 people, then feed just one. That's how we're going to be able to challenge the issues around food insecurity is, is one person at a time. We have a tendency to try and um, swallow everything in one big gigantic program or one big bite. And sometimes it's just the one-on-one -on -one things that we do that helps out. So I do want to give you a little bit of an um, overview of what we do at St. Vincent de Paul. I know those of you who are here in the parish probably know the local group here. They do an incredibly fantastic job. But the Society is actually an international organization um, founded in 1833. And our organization here in Georgia um, operates as an independent 501c3 and an independent um, corporation. I'm the CEO and I report to a board of directors. 
And our organization, we have 77 conferences across the state of Georgia. So just like the group you have here at Transfiguration, there are 76 others. They go from Brunswick to Blairsville and from Lake Hartwell to LaGrange. Um, they're all over. They're in the mountains, they're in the cities. We operate five family support centers that um, provide services to people like those big food pantries I talked about, education centers. We do um, a client screening. We do high like, income tax return. Uh, we do those kind of things. We have 13 first stories. The furthest south is in Brunswick. The furthest north is up here in Kennesaw. And then we also have Buford and Dallas as a little bit out. And then Commerce is our furthest east. Those 13 thrift stores serve a dual mission. They raise money that we use to help uh, fund the programs that we run. But more importantly, from our perspective, is we give away clothing, household goods, and furniture to people in need. So those 77 conferences, they can send a client to us with a voucher, and they can get what they need. We have 38 food pantries uh, spread out all over the state. We have 5,000 active volunteers. So those are volunteers that are going to regular meetings of the conferences, they're doing home visits, they're going out and working with people. And then we have about 800 other volunteers that do occasional work in food pantries and thrift stores and that kind of thing. We uh, provided $17 million plus change in recension services in Georgia last year. We're one of the largest human services nonprofits in the state. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, 129,000 people that we served last year. Those are individuals, that's not families. So those are individual people. Um, 314,000 volunteer hours from people like Bev and others that work uh, in our food pantries and do the casework. And we, pr we provided $8 million in direct financial assistance for people that were about to have their utilities cut off or be evicted or not be able to um, pay for their uh, medical expenses. I mentioned earlier we partner, this is just some, um, some of the people that we partner with, but the key to what we do at St. Vincent de Paul is centered around the home visit. And I mentioned home visit earlier, and I probably should expand on that. When somebody calls us and says, uh, they come to us through United Way 211 or through the parish or through uh, other networks of charity. They call us and they say, I can't, I can't pay my electric bill this month. I have a challenge. Can you help? Well, we don't just take their information over the phone and then send the check off to Georgia Power. But we don't make them come sit in a sterile office and come up to a window with a glass, a glass window with a hole in it and, and pass paper. We send two human beings two of our Vincentians to their home to sit down with them and find out what are the challenges? Why, you know, we'll pay your electric bill, but if we pay it, who's gonna pay it next month? How's it gonna get paid? One of the things we find, going back to, to um, going back to some of this stuff, is when we go out on those home visits, people have called us and said, I can't pay my electric bill. We go into the home and we find out there's no furniture, the kids have no clothes, there's no food in the refrigerator, so we're able to holistically look at how can we help. And then from that home visit, we are able to also, when necessary, reach out to these and many, many other partners that we work with and see if we can help provide solutions for what their challenges are. So Morehouse School of Medicine, we work in our Lakewood Family Support Center to look at social determinants of health, to look at behavioral aspects of health that are causing people to go into poverty, people who can't work, people who can't get SSI because of some challenge. So Morehouse has worked really closely with that. Georgia Power has been an incredible partner in trying to help people, um, as I mentioned earlier with this new, uh, with this federal government shutdown, um, they've been, they've just been amazing. The Atlanta Community Food Bank, I think everybody knows, organization. Mercy Care uh, works with us in providing medical services to the poor. And we're very blessed in Shamley that they opened a brand new facility three blocks from us. Um, Gas South has been one of the organizations that was out front on poverty and they um, came up with the first pay-as-you-go gas utility program here in Georgia. 
So what was happening was, I'm in poverty, I can't make my gas bill payment, so I just kind of boil it off because I want to eat and I pay for food. And the next month is bigger. Well, most of these utilities, by the time they catch up with you, you've got a three month backlog of payments and then there's a huge reconnect fee. So by the time we get to them or they come to us, they're handing us a gas bill that's a thousand dollars and saying I need, and that's a challenge, right? So Gas South came up with this program called Pay As You Go. And what they did was it's a prepaid, prepaid gas service. So people can sign up who have no credit because you, know, you have to run a credit check and get your electric and your gas and your water and all that. Well, that's the other thing. If you have bad credit, they won't give you gas service unless you make a huge deposit. If you're poor, you don't have money to make a huge deposit. So now you're in a catch-22. So through pay as you go, what they do is they say, okay, prepay your gas service, and then as you use it, if you get to the point where it's going to be uh, run out, we'll let you know, and then you can add more to it. So real good social um, social consciousness on their part. So they're a great partner with us. The food recovery and distribution program I mentioned earlier, this is one of, the way, one of the ways we're trying to address food insecurity. We have a partnership with Kroger where we go out to 45 participating retail partners, most of them Kroger's, 41 of the stores are Kroger's. We have two trucks that are on the road five days a week with uh, drivers and helpers, and we are bringing back 25 tons of food per month. And that's not a misprint, that's 25 tons a month per food. 25 tons per month of mostly frozen meats and vegetables and high quality protein food that we can then use to supplement <coughs> the mac and cheese and the other things we're talking about. Um, it's an incredible program. Transfiguration gets meat from it. One of the challenges of the program is that we're at the mercy of what Kroger has because what happens is Kroger, as food on their shelves reaches shelf expiration date, Hopefully you all know that stuff is still good for a minimum of two weeks to, to prepare it. Well, they pull it off the shelf and they freeze it, which means it's good for about three months. And then we have a huge refrigerator freezer in our Shamley facility. We bring everything in there, we sort it, and we send it out. But if, if Kroger has an excess of pig's feet, we get a bunch of pig's feet, and then we send it out to food pantries, and then I get nasty calls from transfiguration people going, we're getting all this food they're just not but you know it's a it's a blessing thanksgiving time we get a bunch of turkeys and those kind of things this is an incredible program Kroger has asked us to double that number to 50 tons per month so part of our six and a half million dollar capital campaign is to double the size of our food pantry and our warehouse to do that we'll also need to get at least one more refrigerator truck so that's one of our trucks and drivers down here in the bottom right um, that, that helped do the Kroger program. And one thing I do want to cl uh, close about segments, as Paul mentioning, because we're very proud of it, is we have a, an incredible commitment to stewardship. So if you're a parishioner and you're listening to this and you're um, one who contributes every uh, month to the fund that goes to St. Vincent de Paul, um, organizationally, we, um, we use 90 cents of every dollar directly for programs and services. And that not only includes what's used at the conference, but what we collect through our other fundraising. That's one of the best percentages, overhead percentages, the smallest overhead percentages of any nonprofit um, in Georgia or in the United States. And the reason is because of those 5,000 volunteers. We operate everything you just heard about. I have a staff of 30, and that includes truck drivers and, and warehouse people. So we're not heavily burdened with overhead. Um, and if you come visit our facility, you'll see that we are not um, heavily burdened with a fancy facility either. Um, we post our IRS 990 and our audited financials on our website proactively. So anybody who wants to can go to the website and access those documents and see uh, behind the curtain of what we're doing. And we had, when this slide was put together, we had a four-star charity navigator rating. We have a five-star charity. We're very proud of the stuff that we do. And that's all I had to talk about. I didn't think we would make it till nine, but I've actually gone much further than I expected. Are there any questions anybody has? I hope you learned something. I hope it was beneficial. I didn't see anybody snooze and fall asleep. I think that was a good thing.
you have a question there? I do. Um, I think she wants you to talk in the mic so okay. Facebook people <laughs> can hear you. Can you hear me? Sorry, because this will be live. John, you, you, the work you do and, and the people at St. Vincent de Paul is obviously remarkable, and my hat's off to you. I think everybody is very impressed. Um, and this may be, you know, a simplistic question, but so so, what else? What what can we do so that there are not so many people that are food insecure? It's wonderful that you're addressing right. food insecurity, right. but what behind it? Yeah. What can we do? Well. You know, we didn't we didn't spend as much time as we could have delving into some of those solutions, but it, it's really is going to take an integrated effort of social services agencies, schools, government, and private industry to put together a, a big solution. The challenge we have in the nonprofit sector, and we've had it since the '60s when the war on poverty started, was we've created these programs that all stand individually, and they're all individually very effective. But we don't put them together into, as I said earlier, these integrated blankets. You know, the safety net isn't a safety net. It's a series of, of little, uh, little mattresses. And we're hoping that we're going to catch somebody in this mattress or in this mattress, but maybe they're going to fall right down through. What we really need is a safety net where everything is, is crocheted together so that people can't fall through. In order to be able to do that, we have to address issues like how do we, and, and these are slowly but surely trying to be addressed, but issues like how do we make school buildings available over the summer so that kids that are um, getting school meals during the day can continue to get meals over the summer. So there are a number of approaches that are being used now. Boys and Girls Clubs does a great job of having food uh, service available over the summer for kids. Uh, Action Ministries, which is the Methodist equivalent of St. Vincent de Paul, does great work going out and preparing meals and delivering them through, uh, like volunteers have a van full of sandwiches and stuff and they go to neighborhoods with the kids. And those are all great, but they're patchwork. So what we need to look at is how can we get um, the Cobb County School District to work with organizations like MUST and St. Vincent de Paul and others and open the schools up so that we can serve breakfast every morning or we can serve lunch. Um, we have to look at things like transportation issues, which are huge, which are tied to job opportunities. So I, was, I did a poverty seminar in Macon a couple of years ago, and we were in a breakout session, and there was a table of people, and I was kind of going around to different um, breakouts and listening in, and this guy from the Macon Economic Development Agency was bragging on the fact that they had brought in this big logistical warehouse um, place that was going to open up all these jobs. And there was this older African-American woman who was a community activist who was kind of sitting across the table from him, and she looked at him and she said, that's wonderful, but where do you put that center? There's no mass transportation to get there, and all the poor people without jobs are on the other side of town. So you didn't do anything. She said, you might as well put it on the moon. So there needs to be an integration. And this is something I've been working closely with the Atlanta Regional Commission for about the last five years. The Atlanta Regional Commission is trying to see if they can be the convener of that conversation of how do we bring development authorities, um, nonprofit agencies, government, educators together to have the conversation. There need, the bottom line answer is there needs to be a significantly more collaboration, cooperation, and discussion up front. And, and, and because if not, we just continue where we are. Yes, sir. John, um, I work a lot here with the food bank. My wife helps run the food bank here. Um, she's a long term supporter. Um, I'm working on a separate program. When we talked about getting things together, you mentioned the Pay As You Go program that Gas South has. Um, I'm working on a program called Pay As You Save, which is a national program. In Georgia, for example, there's 42 electric co-ops. Right. Those co-ops are member-owned. They're not investor-owned. They're member-owned. So they want to do things for investors. There's right. money available from USDA, billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Medicaid expansion, except there's, I don't have to go through 
a legislature or a governor or anything. It's just money available. So all the EMC has to do is ask for it. So many members here are at Cobb EMC. And I'm working on the energy burden because what a lot of the electric co-ops do, they're not utilities, they're co-ops. They have to buy power from George Power. Right. They don't like buying power because it makes them expensive. So they would like to bring their own cost. So the way you do that is you go to you go to somebody who we're helping and you say, you know, would you like an energy audit? So the workforce thing, you put somebody to work doing an audit. They're paid for because the USDA is going to pay it. Mm -hmm. It's done. Um, it may cost ten thousand dollars to weatherize your home and get you a new refrigerator and whatever appliances you need to get updated. It may be that much, and guess what? The EMC will pay for it. It's not like a one-off thing. It's paid for, and they do it with paid to save. So it's available for homeowners and it's available for renters. It stays with the property. So if I own a big bunch of apartments, I can put that to work as a building, and everybody. And as, as people are transient, yeah, we move around. It, it and how we can maybe integrate those. So it builds. It builds up. It gets even better. So people that have the, are on these programs, like in other states, North Carolina, Arkansas, they, work. they end up lowering their energy bill. They, they save money, so it lowers that burden so they can spend it on things like food or more important mm -hmm. budget items. And then secondly, their health care improves because they've already, already all of a sudden, you know, mold in the house and that kind of thing is, is gone. And so their health care costs go down, their health care insurance goes down, and it's, it's kind of win-win. So it's it's a firm that I'm hoping to launch more with, I want to be close with St. Vincent as we go forward because I think. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Can you make your main role? Yes. The, the, the co-ops, I don't know if you know, the co-ops in Georgia is probably 50% of the energy. Oh, yeah, we work closely with all of Georgia them. Power is Tax and EMC, County yeah. EMC, and Grace, Grace right. and EMC have provided really good financial support for us. So really good work. And we yes. work with Uncle Thorpe, which is the, yeah. that's where most of the energy Okay, we have one last question from Facebook, okay? Do you go out into the community and find out what it is that the folks want or need in these food desert areas? Um, I'm not sure I 100% understand the question, but if it's do we go out and try to tailor our food pantry offerings to the demographics of the area and ethnicity, and the answer is to the degree we can, yes, but um, we're limited by the food donations we get. But we do have, um, like we have a, a Diaz Foods, which provides a lot of um, Hispanic, Mexican food to Hispanic restaurants and stuff. Renee Diaz is very generous and has supported us, so we make sure that that food goes to an area um, that is going to be used. The Lakewood Heights area, for example, is predominantly an African American area, so we're not going to put that type of thing in Lakewood. The Shamley Family Support Center is predominantly Hispanic, so we're able to, um, so we can put it there. Our Stone Mountain Family Support Center, that is the ultimate hodgepodge of, you know, it's by uh, Clarkson and all the refugee resettlement immigration area. So there's, you know, our, our first store over there has about six different languages that are volunteers. Thank you for your attention and great questions. Thank you, John. Yeah, I hope thank you, you learned something from it and thank you. Thank you.